Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DICES webinar series. My name is Kristen Marr, and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at DICES. Today's webinar is Save Money and Gain Productivity with Robotic Process Automation. If you would like to find out more about DICES and the services we provide, please go to DICES.com or one of our many social media sites. We have muted everyone in attendance today, so if you, have, if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask us on Twitter using the hashtag RPAWebinar. You can also ask questions on, using the chat box located on the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel. We will address all of your questions at the very end of the presentation. Our speaker today is Jeff Giangiulio, Director of Global Services here at DICES, where he has developed our Automation Center of Excellence which includes test automation, robotics process automation, and orchestration. We will also be joined by Alan Childress, a process automation engineer with over 20 years of experience in AI, business, business de development roles, and automated testing and robotic process automation. Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. All right, well, thank you so much, Kristen, and uh, thank you for the nice introduction, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I hope everybody's got something to eat. I know it's lunchtime. Uh, if not, hopefully we'll make you hungry from some robotic process automation or uh, some food by the end of this. So uh, again, thank you guys all for joining. We really appreciate it. We have a nice crowd today. Um, so as was just stated by Chris, and I'm our Global Services Director here at DICES, and I currently lead our Automation Center of Excellence. So I just wanted to set some context and explain a little bit about what our Automation Center of Excellence is which we've actually currently branded as ACE. So anytime you hear me mention ACE, that's we're talking about the autom our Automation Center of Excellence. And uh, ACE really consists of three different towers. So the three towers comprises of test, script, and robotic process automation. Uh, sometimes we find in engagements that it's good, this engagements fit one of these solutions, or they may fit all three of these solutions depending on the need. But this webinar, we're really going to focus on robotics process automation. And um, for the rest of the webinar, you'll also hear me refer to that mostly as RPA. Uh, so at the end of the webinar, we're really hoping those who are new to RPA will have a general understanding of what RPA is and what kind of use cases you can look for in your organization and the approach to implementing RPA in your organization. And then I know we have some joining who are probably already familiar with RPA, be it developers or somebody who's implementing it in your organization. And for those folks, we're really hoping that you will get some learning value about some possible new use cases that you haven't thought of. And through Alan, who's been on the ground, he's going to provide some tips and tricks uh, through our trials and triumphs uh, during our own automation journey, both internally and externally. So uh, let's get started. There we go. Sorry, a little trouble there. So again, with the agenda and what we're going to go over, uh, we're really breaking this into two sections. So you've got the why and you've got the how. So why RPA um, really consists of two parts. The first section we're going to go of what, of what is RPA. Um, and how can RPA save you time, money, and increase productivity and efficiency all at the same time? Uh, and then we're going to go over some processes to automate. Now, there's hundreds of processes out there that might be possible use cases, but we're going to boil it down to just some common processes that are automated out in the field just to, just to kind of get you thinking um, within your own organization about what you might be able to automate. And then uh, we're going to go into the how, and this is where we really review our approach, um, both how you would want to bring automation and robotics process automation into your organization, and how you can build a center of excellence around robotics process automation and the approach DICES takes to doing this both internally and externally for our clients. Finally, we'll um, finish up with Alan's going to go over, Alan, Alan's on the ground floor, uh, he's been developing different types of automation, be it test automation, robotics process automation, and even cognitive automation for the past, uh, I think, 10 to 15 years. So he's going to go over some tips and tricks that he's found in the field 
and some lessons learned to help you on your journey if you actually currently are on a robotics process automation journey. So the why. So I wanted to uh, put this slide here to set a little bit of context um, on where the RPA market is. So on the left, you'll see a graph which uh, we actually went to Google and we searched for the term robotic process automation within the last two years. So you can see from 2014 to 2016. And, on, and so you can kind of see the interest over time and the growth rate that you see there. Um, on the right is a graph from 2013 to 2020 that a market research company did a study and they predicted around 60% compound annual growth rate uh, within the RPA market from 2013 to 2020. I think it's really interesting if you look at the patterns of the two graphs, um, the now on the left is pretty in par with the, um, the pattern that you see on the right with the compound annual growth rate uh, prediction. So, I mean, in short, you can see RPA is definitely coming and it's definitely gaining interest in the industry. Um, I really, I kind of break it down into two factors. Obviously, there's a lot of factors that are creating this phenomenon. But um, really, the first factor I see is business businesses competing are constantly, the competition is getting stronger and stronger every single day. And they have a need to optimize operations and save time and money. Businesses are going global and lowering cost of operations and improving efficiency of operations due to the, the vast competition that people are, are facing today is creating them to look at outside sources and innovation such as automation. Uh, the second major factor I see is an improvement of these RPA tools. So if you, if you look back, when you talk about robotics process automation, um, automation in some form or fashion has been around for a long time. And, and there, it started with scripting, with macros, and now it's grown into uh, RPA and even above and beyond with cognitive tools and uh, border borderline things like IBM Watson with, with um, analytics. And so, so you can see how it's grown over time. And, I, and I, I really think that the improvement of these tools and the improvement of the RPA tools has had a significant impact on the growth in the market that we're seeing right now. So let's get into a little bit about what RPA really is. And again, this is for those of you who are, are new to RPA and not so sure what, what it is. Um, so if you look at RPA as a whole, you can really think of it as a virtual assistant. Um, when, you, when, you run RP, when you run an RPA program, you will actually see the mouse moving. You're going to see the keyboard typing. Um, and you're gonna, it's basically everything that the user would do on mundane clerical tasks day to day. So whether it be copy and pasting or anything that's done through the front end. Now RPA can expand and they can go out into APIs and um, it can go out into cognitive learning. But at the core root of RPA, it's basically mimicking what the user does. So you can think of a robot, an RPA robot, just as another person, as another assistant. It actually runs, not to get too technical, but they, most of them run just on a typical Windows machine and they run just like the user would. It takes over the machine and the bot runs the front end like the user. So there's a lot of different scenarios that are used in RPA. <laughs> uh, I'm going to run down some of the lists you see here. So dual data entry scenarios uh, is a very common one. Um, so for example, you may have data in one application or an Excel spreadsheet and you need to move it simply to another application based off a set of business rules. Uh, that's a great use case for RPA right there. Another th one is straight through processing. So for example, sometimes you may want to gather data from multiple sources, uh, both unstructured and structured data. So you might want to get data from uh, invoices, emails, Excel files, PDF files, different systems, bring all that data in, correlate it, run some business rules, and then move it into a system, which is a very common clerical 
tasks that you see out in the marketplace. Uh, a lot of times, for example, you may want to move it into an ERP system or a CRM system or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, thir a third section of RPA is uh, virtual integration, and it's used a lot for virtual integration. So <laughs> sometimes when you want to integrate two pieces of software, there could be multiple factors stopping this to happen. Uh, it could be bureaucracy within, the, within the, your organization. It could be a lack of connection to APIs or a lack of opening of APIs due to the security policies. So sometimes, for example, you may want to integrate a green screen into a newer ERP system that to connect those two on the back end could cost a lot of money um, and a lot of time. You're going to have to have developers who understand the old maybe AS400s. You're going to have developers who understand the newer ERP systems, and you're going to have to build that integration between them if you even can. So it's kind of a great way to virtually integrate quickly um, different systems together. And then a the final one is that I see a lot is responses to requests for data. So as an example, we had a client who was basically, I, I think it was somewhere around a thousand times a month, people were requesting reports. And they're requesting ports through a ticket system, um, like via the service now. And all the, all, all the end user was really doing was taking a look at the ticket, figuring out what kind of report they wanted, and then taking that, going and finding that report, downloading that report, creating a couple manipulations, and emailing that report. Um, this was taking months of time to do because of the volume of reports we had. And we were able to automate that whole solution to save drastic amounts. I think it was over uh, somewhere around 70% savings on time uh, based off just automating that. So the, the, the bot actually went in, read what was going on in the ticket, figured out what kind of report they were going to look for, went and opened up the folder, and emailed it. So again, you can see it's just, just acting as a user. Um, and last but not least, most... Mostly when it comes to RPA, you're working on things that are rules-based based decisions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the coming slides. So we're still in the, uh, in the why section. And obviously, why is RPA important? And there's a lot of benefits to RPA. Obviously, the benefit that sticks out first is operational cost savings. Um, basically, you can think of it as a bot equal to one to five FT, FTEs, depending on what those FTEs are doing. So a lot of times you don't want to just replace the, the, the FTEs, but instead take them and repurpose them to do more productive work. So that's where you can see the increased production of two to five times more, more productive work. Then you'll also have some direct benefits like fewer human errors. So um, and actually, these numbers you see on the right are from the Institute of Robotic Process Automation. And these are industry standard numbers. And from what we've seen in the industry and from our examples, we've seen these to be about on par. Um, and and when, you come, when you come to fewer human errors, um, one thing that's really nice about that is not only is it, is it giving less errors, but it's also logging everything that you do. So when somebody's doing manual processes within your organization, a lot of times they're they're not logging every single thing that's happening. They're not keeping an audit trail, and that that can be of a lot of value, both for compliance and many other reasons. If anything goes wrong, um, and then if you see there's those are the direct benefits. You've also got some indirect benefits. Uh, standardization. When you when you get into RPA, you need to standardize the process, and it's almost forced to do some business process management forces you to standardize all of your processes and make sure they're foolproof. Um, also, compliance and legal requirements, because of the logging, uh, what I mentioned, you, you, can, you can really simplify your compliance requirements and make it a lot easier to comply with um, the requirements that are at hand. Uh, another indirect benefit is it's non-invasive. So you don't have to deal with the direct internet in, integration coding like I mentioned. Um, it does work on the front end and you can just virtually integrate the two systems without having to do that. Um, so that's just a little bit about uh, why RPA seems to be gaining traction in the industry and how it can 
both help you save cost and improve productivity. So I can, I mean, I can really talk about RPI all day, and for me at least personally, I when I see things, it just helps me understand. So what I wanted to do was give you guys a, a brief demo to show you. RPA in action, and a lot of the RPA that we've done within DICE's and external for our clients are sensitive materials. So we made pretty much a generic demo here, which is really going to show you gathering data from spreadsheets, gathering data from a PDF. The PDF will be in the background, so it can gather data from both um, structured and unstructured data, and then it's going to move that into a web browser system. And you'll actually see the mouse moving. Um, and you'll see it clicking and, and going through the whole process and the end you'll see the type of log that it that it creates. So let me kick the demo off. This is just showing you that um, it's completely empty tables at the time. And here what we're doing is we're taking a form and it's an Excel form and we're inputting the directory. And what that directory did right there, the second we, I'm going to pause, the second we put that form into the directory, um, it kicked off the process. So RPA has triggers. It can trigger via email. Uh, it can trigger via a file going into a form. And as you can see there, that trigger via the file being going into the form. So now it's going to start running. I'm sorry. One second. Let me run this again. So again, we're taking the input, the file that was sent, put it in here. Now it's going to trigger. The second it pastes in there, you'll see on the bottom right-hand corner, it's going to trigger the bot to start running. So the bot's warming up and getting ready to run. Now it's going to go through and get all the data from this Excel spreadsheet. And it's not just getting the data, it's actually going to be validating the data. So it's making sure that, for example, the site number, um, is numeric and not alphanumeric. It's making sure that the address is checking the address against another um, database to make sure that address is actually in our system. And then at that point, it's going to take all that data, which you didn't see is it gathered data from a PDF as well, and it's going to start filling in the form. So you can see here it's just filling in the form, submitting it, open, get clicked, open up the next part of the form. And then at the end here, I just want to pause. And this is something that's really nice that, uh, that I like a lot, is you can see you get detailed level of the logging. So unlike when people are doing these kind of things manually, you're going to know everything and anything that happened. Uh, if you look on line 22 here, you'll see it's, it, it shows a warning. Um, the address wasn't found in the lookup database. And we've programmed it based off a business rule to actually create that new address in the lookup database. So you'll see these type of things and you'll know exactly what goes on when you go back to the audit trail. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a little better idea of uh, what RPA is about, and not, I'm really hoping that that demo, we have a lot more demos, so please feel free to reach out after the uh, webinar if you want to hear more about the demos and hear more about the use cases that we've actually done. Okay, so if any, for those of you who don't know what, we're going we're gonna to get into uh, the how now. So for those of you who don't know the if this, then that term, that's IFTT, if then, this, that. And what I really see is bots can really become the IFTTT for your enterprise, the if then, this, that. So what they'll do is that as long as it's rule-based, um, it's going to connect multiple applications, multiple types of media, be it PDF, um, Texts, emails, whatever it might be, it's going to be able to connect all of those and based off different business rules, provide um, processing for your data throughout your organization.
So I'm going to go here into uh, some common automated use cases. So there's um, there's actually hundreds of use cases. I just wanted to, to bring up a few that I see commonly in the industry. Maybe uh, get, get your brains thinking about what I could do within my organization. And, um, and oh, again, please reach out at the end if you want to hear more about uh, what type of processes that we've automated and that we see you can automate in the industry. So I broke it out into six different sectors. First sector being IT. And there's a common use case we see there, which is really around account provisioning and deprovisioning. Uh, as an example, we had a client who um, processes 20 to 30,000 RSA tokens a month. And they actually, I might have been shorter a month, but I believe it's 20 to 30,000 RSA tokens a month. And what they needed us to do was both provision those tokens and deprovision the tokens. So far, we've actually done the deprovisioning part, and we're in the process of getting started on the provisioning part. But um, as far as the deprovisioning, it just rolls through and deprovisions the tokens based off a cell spreadsheet we get with about 20,000 records. And then we go through into their RSA token platform and just we, we remove their accounts for privileges. We remove the token from their account. And then we report back what's happened. It's been, it's been a very nice use case. Um, Another use case that I see is within HR for onboarding employees. So when you onboard employees, you typically typically need to perform actions across a variety of different applications. So for example, if you need to enter information into the finance system to ensure employees receive proper pay, while at the same time you probably have to enter information into the security system to assure they're going to receive proper access as well. Um, and my guess is there's a, there's a lot more different systems that you're going to have to enter manual information whenever you bring in boy, an employee on board within your organization. So that's a great use case that I see out there. Um, probably the most common one that we've seen is claims processing within the industry. And what claims processing is, is it typically involves uh, at the manual level, you have a claims examiner who's going to make decisions and actions on claims based on a very specific set of rules. And uh, that makes it a great use case for RPA. Another one I've seen within, within healthcare, within the healthcare industry, is a lot of patient old data is sitting on old Unix systems and they need to be moved to new EMR systems. And a lot of times the links between these two and the backend APIs are not set up or are very complex or very, very pricey to get done. So it's, um, it's a quicker, faster, cheaper way to, uh, to get the data from the old systems into the new systems. Also within the finance, I want to explain um, one in there is uh, anytime accounts payable is anything within accounts payable is usually a good use case for RPA as typically it includes data collections from thousands of different sources like emails, and multiple other systems and manual and then they take all those they correlate them and then they manual enter that data in the ERP something that um, I think is being done a lot in the industry around finance and lastly uh, in the banking industry um, a lot of banks we and this is something we we've done as well and we're currently in the process of working on but a lot of banks they uh, they need to perform compliance checks for their customers so what they, what they want to do is they want to check that every bank customer um, has a necessary amount of files, has the proper files, and also that they have the necessary contracts and signatures. And with RPA, you can, like I was mentioning, you can read unstructured data. So you can go in and you can check the documents and make sure that there's a signature on this document and make sure that, this doc that they have the proper documents to make sure it's compliant. So um, hopefully that just gives you an idea of the kind of things that uh, RPA is being used out in the industry. So we're going to go um, go into the how now, and um, really, I want to say RPA to bring RPA into your organization. It, it is a journey. It, it's not a sprint. Um, and you can see this is the flow that we typically see of how RPA enters an organization. 
And firstly, the first thing that you really have to do is uh, gain the business support. You need to gain the high-level business support. And the way you do that is you identify a couple opportunities and you connect, conduct um, a couple proof of concepts which can, can show ROI uh, to the business. And the second they see the ROI, which typically in RPA initiatives is, is pretty substantial, and um, pretty impressive. And then at the same time, you're going to evaluate the vendors and make sure there's lots of different RPA vendors out there. There's probably four main vendors. Um, here at Dice's, we're, we're vendor agnostic, so I don't want to go into which one's better or worse. But um, each one has their own pros and each one has their own cons. So gain the business support, figure out the vendors that are best for you, and make sure to do a couple proof of concepts. Then once you're, once you're set and you're bought on to RPA, um, you'll want to set up a center of excellence. And uh, I'm going to go actually in the future slides a little more into what our center of excellence looks like and, and how we build our center of excellence and how it flows. Um, after the center of excellence is set up, you're going to want to scale within the organization. What I found is after a couple positive use cases, or uh, po a couple positive implementations and other departments start to hear wind at the water cooler, or whoever it might be, um, they start to they, they start to come to you. It's, it's, it organically grows. But I think on top of them coming to you, it's smart to kind of create a task force of evangelists to go to the departments, take a look at their processes, let them know what RPA can do for them and to, to help them understand how they can utilize RPA and that will allow you to scale it. Um, and eventually you're hoping that you can embed RPA into your normal every day to day life um, and, and I think as you go through this journey you'll, you'll realize that that's something you definitely want to do and in, in the end it really is going to save you some money, it's going to add a lot of efficiency and um, you're going to have a head up, the uh, heads up on the competition out there who haven't done this within their operations. You're going to have a virtual workforce that uh, is going to work hand in hand with your current human workforce. So a little bit about the center of excellence and how you can look at how you could set one up. Um, again, we're in the how section here. So this is, this is what our center of excellence looks like. It's more of a factory model. What we do is we come in at the higher business analysis level. Uh, you don't want to just take on any process. You want to make sure that the process is worth it, that the ROI is there, that the business is bought on. Um, and then you want to make sure that you properly standardize and document the process. Um, at that point, we usually, actually right before that, I'm sorry, I step one, one back, but I do want to step back for a second, assessment and tool of tools. You, you do want to do that in conjunction with the business analysis. You want to make sure that you have the right tools for your job. Um, once that you've identified a list of processes, you go into the development shop where you will architect and develop the RPAs and then obviously integrate it into your production environment. So I'm going to break this down a little bit into how we do it. Um, and this is basically a breakdown of the slide you just saw. But in the first phase, we look, we look at the process. Um, we look at a bunch of processes. And we look at, uh, is it feasible? Is this something that can be automated? If it's a lot of human complete judgment calls, the odds are it's not going to be automated. Um, or if there's like handwritten documents, it's going to be a little tough, not impossible. But we really look at what is the feasibility and how much of your process can you automate? Is it 50%, 100%, 80%? And that's the first thing that we do because if it's not feasible, there's no, no chance of, no reason to go further. Uh, the next thing we do is we've actually built a, a very custom calculator that we've worked on for a while. So there's a deep algorithm behind it. But we look at uh, what, what is the effort to, to do this process based off a, a bunch of different things? How complex are the process steps? How much data are you looking at? Um, how many personnel are currently doing it? And how long does it take them to get trained? So we, we, get a, we get an idea of what the actual effort from the services perspective. Then we put all that together and we create an ROI. 
And it really, the, the number one thing around the ROI is there's a, there's a lot of different indirect and direct benefits, like I mentioned, but the number one thing is FTEs. How many FTEs are involved in this? If you have a process that's taking you, and, and, and it fits in the feasibility, and it's taking you 20 to 40 FTEs, I almost guarantee you that you're going to see very, very substantial ROI. Um, but then we also look at other pieces of ROIs, like uh, error reduction. Um, you know, errors can be very costly, and it can lose both customer satisfaction, and it can cost money. So, so there's a lot of different things we look at when we go into the ROI. Uh, following that, we basically come up with a business case analysis, and it's like a change management meeting, and we figure, should, should we or shouldn't we put this into the process pipeline? Assuming we do put it into the process pipeline, we have a backlog of prioritization, and uh, we, look, we prioritize them based off a bunch of different factors to figure out which ones are going, which ones we should start automating first. Um, you can see the factors at the bottom based off manual dollars saved, hours saved, um, how much are we going to save on error reduction, all those kind of things. And, and this calculator builds in, just gives us an idea. Obviously, the end, at the end, we're really going to have a meeting around and determine based off the data what we want to do. But helps us prioritize which processes to attack first. Once we've decided that, we bring it into our development shop. And when you're developing RPA, I find Agile, the Agile lifecycle approach, is really the best way to go. Um, you'll find that the average, I would say, the average process is anywhere from two weeks to six months. So uh, we try to break it into three to four month chunks. And, and then we integrate them together within the, the Agile software development lifecycle. So at this point, I'm actually going to toss it over to Alan Childress, who's going to go a little bit into his experience in the field and uh, what he's seen on the ground. So if you are one of those who are currently involved in uh, building RPA in your organization, or if you're just interested in general, um, we want to give you a little insight into what we've learned over time and some advisory to, to help you out. So, uh, Alan, it's all yours. I believe, Alan, you might be muted. Kristen, do you mind uh, unmuting Alan? Alan should be all set. Okay. Uh, there we go. There we hello, go. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, no so, thank you, Jeff. And we would just want to talk through some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. One of the primary things is during your documentation phase, you want to go through and over on the right hand side, you can see individual steps of the requirements that we go through. The individual clicking of the enter key, the tab key, and individual steps, and then explanations for why those things exist. Those will be very important requirements that you'll need to refer back to as things happen through the process. And we like to then carry that through. Uh, in the lower left, you can see in the code itself, and comments in so that you can refer back to those particular steps. So when something goes amiss, then you know which particular step if you need to adjust it. Sometimes you have to reorganize the steps to make it more efficient. And the um, one of the other important things to do is to break the code into manageable chunks. This code can get to be large 2,000 line chunks and it's better to break it down to about 500 lines each it makes it more manageable and that way you can have multiple developers within the same process. You don't want to have one monolithic piece of code because then you get a bottleneck with one developer and by breaking it up then you can have team development working together. Another important thing is using code reuse and you can have certain modules that do the same thing such as closing all your browser windows before you start up, having a central login to a particular system that you reuse across tasks. 
error recovery that gets you back to a certain point if, for example, the network disconnects or one of the systems fails and you can go back to a standard error recovery. Those all work well within task modules. There's a concept of text or test fixtures and they are basically getting you down to a standard starting point. And so you may have 10 different tasks that all start from a certain point. You can reuse the code to get you to that point and that's called a test fixture. And then another, another important thing is having proper security authorization in place. Um, don't underestimate the amount of time that it can take sometimes within an organization to get authorization for things. And as you start up RPA, sometimes there can be a cultural shock in terms of actually getting an account authorized for a non-human. And so prepare for that and work with your organization to help them understand how it's going to be doing the same thing as the humans and won't have any further or greater authorizations than the human that can help build trust on what this tool is going to do. And as Jeff had said, you know, you're just working from the surface level and it can work very well. But it can, again, be a shock when it doesn't actually have a physical address associated with it, et cetera. All right. And so a core part of any development process is maintenance. And that's true here with RPA as well. And so the requirements are very important and they affect everything. Uh, you go through and you design and then you have the implementation and testing in production can be important, but then you want to be able to be flexible as things change. Things are going to change. And so by having configurable information, typically in either a spreadsheet or in a CSV file, you can encrypt both and they can have the credentials that you need, the systems that you're going to log into, et cetera. And so, for example, going from development through UAT on into production, then you'll have different configuration settings. It's the same code, but then it uses the different configuration settings, and that makes it much easier and more flexible than going into your code and actually changing it over time. That will provide a drastic savings in terms of time. Another important thing is strong change control, and you want to uh, have a good change control system because otherwise you can lose important code. It helps migrate the code through this process from UAT into production. It works, integrates well with your operations team. And so um, it's also a cultural change within an organization to take configuration files and put those into change control. But that actually makes for much, it, it reduces a lot of the chaos that can happen by having proper change control in those systems. Um, you also want to keep your automation code current application changes. So get integrated with your other teams of the systems that you're integrating and that you're automating. Make sure that you are staying ahead of the curve. You don't want to find out because your system crashed that something changed. You want to know that it's coming. They typically warned you two or three weeks in advance and so you're prepared and on the same day as they make their changes, you make your changes. And so it's a smooth transition. But it's important that you get yourself hooked in within the organization to work with those teams. The next. There we go. Um, and so finally, as Jeff was talking about, the importance of logs can save a lot of time and a lot of heartache um, by having everything tracked. Then you know which bot was working, what step it was working on, uh, the English description of what was going on at the time, and then the object that was involved and the particular attribute. So if something goes wrong, you know why. You can reproduce your steps from production back in development. And a good step also is to create a date stamped folder and inside of that put all of your input files, your logs, your output files, and your screenshots. That way you have one artifact you can zip up if necessary, email it to a particular developer, um, and go back and find something that happened you know, two months ago based on date, et cetera. So it's good to wrap all that up into a date stamped folder. As we said, it's important to log everything that you can. Um, information is always valuable in terms of detecting things later. And so screenshots are very valuable along the way. And those can also go in the same file. So those are some of the primary lessons that we've learned. Again, gathering requirements 
is very important and keeping tight integration all the way through the process back to those requirements, keeping that tight is very important. So thank you and Jeff, uh, back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Alan. Thanks for uh, that insight. So, um, so far, you know, we went over the the why for robotics process automation and the how um, around what is RPA, some process to automate, uh, a little bit about a high level approach, and Alan went over some tips and tricks. I want to open it up to the, at this time to uh, Q and A. We went a little longer than I thought, so hopefully we have amp. Ample of my time for Q&A. If, if there's anything you guys want to ask afterwards, I'll, I'll share my email, um, which is on the next slide. And you please feel free to email me directly at any time. But uh, I'm going to open it up now to uh, any, any questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions, Jeff. Um, the first one is, uh, in your experience, is it possible for a process to achieve 100% automation? What are the pros and cons of that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And we, I think the first one that I mentioned, which was the RSA token decommissioning, um, we were 100% automation. And it, we, we really haven't found any cons if it, if it comes to, comes up to 100%. So far, uh, I'd say on average, you're looking at most will come around 90% automation, um, but you will have your processes that, that are 100% automation, and as long as it's, it's logged properly at the end, um, I, I, I really haven't found any issues with that, with that occurring. Uh, I will say that you do, so let me, let me say one other thing there, you do have to manage it. So even because even because it's working 100% it's 100% automated, it's flowing and it, it's working smoothly. You do have to like Alan said, you do have to be very weary of change control because a lot of this is front end. So if the application changes, you're going to have to change with it, right? So you need to be involved in the change control because it may be 100% automation now, but if they go and change a couple things, um, your automation's probably going to break. But um, no, I've seen a, a fair amount of processes go to 100% automation. Usually, I try to go with 90, but uh, yeah, they, they definitely go there. So, hopefully, that answers your question. Great. Um, we have another question. Can you give some examples on how a marketing department could leverage automation? They want to know about uh, automation tools that are customized tools versus the ones you discussed today. Uh, specifically for a marketing department? Yes. So, uh, so here we're talking about uh, RPA, specifically robotic process automation. Just to reiterate, this is, this is more about mundane clerical work. So anything that you are doing that's uh, mundane clerical work that the user is currently doing, uh, I, I would say reach out to us and, and tell us a little bit about the process you're looking to do. Um, and, and maybe we can we can look if that's a, a candidate for automation. Uh, marketing specific, I do know when it comes to like mass email campaigns and those type of automations, um, there there are some products out there that may be more suited for that. So I'm not one to say you know this is the tool you want to go for. Uh, I I would recommend reaching out to us and letting us know the type of processes you're looking for within marketing and uh, let us take a look and we'll let you know very quickly if it's feasible to automate and uh, using that approach that you saw if, it, if it's worth it to automate. Um, with RPA, there's a lot of, there are a lot of automation marketing tools already pre-built out there. Um, but if there are gaps, yeah, let's, let's take a look and see if there's any with RPA we can do. Okay, great. Um, another question. What's the typical time lapse between uh, before an automated process starts showing some ROI? Uh, so that really depends, and it it very so there's two types of ROI, right? There's like I said, there's a direct and indirect, and you've got the direct ROI as far as cost, and then you've got the indirect uh, ROI as far as error reduction, operational efficiency, and that kind of stuff. 
Um, I would say the second it's in, you're going to see immediate ROI on error reduction and operational efficiency. Uh, depending on the amount of FTEs that you can repurpose uh, will depend on the payback period. Um, on average, for the, the ones that I've seen, um, I'd say two to, two to four month payback period is what I typically see. Um, but again, it really, so if you have a hundred, um, if you, have, let, let, let's put it this way, if you have a hundred employees doing a process and from a services perspective, it's going to take a six months to, to implement it and you're going to take that a hundred down to 20, you're going to see a huge ROI. Um, if you've got two employees doing it and it's going to take us, if it's a very complex process, this is going to take us four um, four weeks to implement it or say four months to implement it, you're not going to see so much ROI. So it really depends on how complex the process is and um, basically how complex the process is and how many FTEs are currently doing the process. Okay, great. Um... So this person's having some problems selling automation to their department, and they want to know what are some what are the clearest benefits benefits to reference when trying to sell someone on this. Okay, um, so some of those and and, and uh, good question again, and I think uh, we will, Kristen, we'll be can we send, we'll send the slide deck out afterwards, correct? Yes, we will um, post this recording um, as soon as we're done, sometime tomorrow. Um, Perfect, perfect. So there was a slide I went over on benefits of, of automation. Um, so if you have a tough time selling it to the department, uh, I would start with that slide, look at, let them know the benefits um, of automation just um, as far as, you know, cost savings, efficiency, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you may want to get them in the, the best way to, to get the business or the department to buy in is to identify a process that uh, a couple FTEs are currently working on that might not be too complex and use that as a proof of concept um, and, and, and the second they see that proof of concept and they see it working smoothly and um, they see the ROI there, it, it, that's, that's immediate buy-in um, from what I've seen. So that's, that's the, the two I would start with verbal and then try to push for find a, find a good process that um, has maybe a high level of errors or a high level of FTEs performing that process. And, um, you know, or even if you just want, you know, two or three FTEs performing the process and, and you want us to build that as a proof of concept, or not even us, it, it build it yourself, and we're always here to help, of course. That's what we do. But, um, but yeah, you build a proof of concept in there and show them. And the second they see this stuff moving, um, it's amazing how quickly the buying comes. <laughs> okay, it looks like we have two more questions. Um, okay. There's some discussion about how automation improves speed to market. Um, what do you guys think are the primary causes and the lags in this process? Can you give some examples of bad workflows or lack of resources? I'm sorry, we can repeat that one more time? Yeah, there, how does how automation improves speed to market? What do you think are the primary lag causes of the lags in the processes? For example, bad workflows or lack of resources? Um, so when, when you talk about automation and, and RPA and why it's, why it's the speed to market is, um, it's, it's funny because a lot of people will say, you know, I, I could just do this with a macro, I could automate this process with a macro or a script, and I, I say, and it's a, it's a bad thing, to, I, I guess it's a straightforward thing to say, if that's the truth, it probably would have happened already, right? And one of the one of the things of RPA is it's fast. Um, it's pretty fast to implement. Now, you do need to implement it properly, um, but, but it is fast. Th think about it. Uh, how many pieces of software out there do you know that within, you know, say two, three months, you can actually repurpose or remove FTEs and, and save money. Um, there's, I don't know really many other softwares that can actually do that. So. Someone wants to clarify, uh, FTE full-time employee? I, I, I hate throwing out acronyms. Yes, full-time employee, I'm sorry. Great, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the very last question. Um, in your experience, are there any processes that shouldn't be automated? 
Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so a couple. Um, first, first and foremost is if this process is has a ton of fuzzy logic and does not have clear business rules, and um, then it's it's probably not going to be a great a great process for you to automate. Um, if every you, now the bots can work together with the humans, they can go back and forth. But if you're needing to get some information, pick up the phone, get some more information, pick up the phone, and, and obviously the bot is not actually a physical walking around thing, um, it's, it's probably not going be not going to be the best. Now when it's a straightforward process, um, I think that's, that's a great use case uh, for, for the automation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, that was the very last question so. Um, I'd like to really thank our presenters, Jeff and Alan, and everyone who attended for their time and attention. If you'd like any more information about DICES, please, please visit DICES.com. And if you have any more questions, um, please feel free to reach out to Jeff directly at his email address on the slide. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone, everyone at our next presentation, and thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you for joining. Take care, everybody. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>